end up, right? And so we thought it'd be a good time for us because we know life can be like a series of tests. And we're studying Joseph who went through a series really of six tests in his life. And most of us don't like tests. Kids usually don't like tests. Can I just get a show of hands of kids who do like tests? Now you're afraid. Anyone else like tests? We want to take pictures because you're a unique bunch and we know who to cheat off of. No, pastor didn't say that, but... But normally we don't like tests because on test day we just think the same thing over and over. Why am I learning this? This is going to be useless. This, will I ever use algebra? You ever seen those memes? One more day complete without using algebra, right? <laughs> but, and by the way, you do, how many algebra users are you out there? Your builders, your, yeah, we use algebra, don't we? They don't believe us. They don't believe us. We sometimes think tests are useless. Let's just get on with life. But not so with God's tests. His tests are always useful because his tests aren't to show us how much we remember. His tests are designed to shape us into something amazing. That means there's purpose for every test that you and I go through in life. Every test in our lives has a divine purpose attached to it. So, it doesn't matter where it came from. It doesn't matter if your test is the result of somebody else, you're a victim of some circumstance, or maybe it's a self-inflicted test. It doesn't matter. God's got a divine purpose intended for that test. And if we don't understand the purpose of the test we're going through, then we're going to miss all God has for us in life. And so we don't want to miss the purpose. Remember the verse from last week. It's in Genesis 50, verse 20. It's a famous verse from Joseph near the end of his life. He welcomes back his betraying brothers back into his presence. And he says, you intended to harm me, but God. Say, but God. No matter what's going on, there's a but God on the other end. But God intended it all for good. He brought me to this position 20-some years later, six tests. He brought me to this position so I could save the lives of many people. Wow, that's a purpose. Everything that Joseph went through, a pit, a palace, a prison, everything was God preparing him for the day he could help God save many lives. That's just amazing. But that's what God is doing in your test, in my test as well. Romans 8, 28 says this, and we know that in all things, say all things. things. Now the kids say all things. Uh, Mom says speak up. In all things, God works for the good of those who love him. And then it says, and called according to his purpose. God is working all things out in your life, including all those trials and tests for the good of those who love him are called according to his purpose. So, so many times we get in a crisis, we get in a situation, we begin to focus on the trial. We begin to focus on the pain itself and all it's doing to us. So little times do we focus on what God is doing in us through the trial, through the test, through the crisis. So if every test has a divine purpose, our main objective is to grab a hold, grasp and understand that purpose and let it shape us to look more like Jesus so that we're more useful to Jesus in our next season. Amen? So don't rush through the test. Take a pause. Learn its purpose, its principle God's trying to teach us. And all the tests in your life, as we see in Joseph's, are not disjointed and disconnected. God uses everyone like building blocks to build on each other for his greatness. So you don't forget about the last test either. You carry the principle that you've learned into the next test. So today, we're going to look at the palace test. The palace test where Joseph was in the palace. But before we do that, because God builds each principle upon each other, 
We're going to revisit Joseph's first test from last week, the pit test, so we can grab a hold of the divine principle that he learned in the pit, that some of us have learned in our pit test, so we can better pass the palace test. Today, everyone's going to pass a test. Isn't that awesome? I don't know how you did in school. Maybe you failed all your tests. Today, you're passing the test. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that all things are under your observation, control, intention, and divine purposes. And there's many souls in this room that are going through many different things. Some, of the, some going through pit tests and pallet tests and all sorts of crises. And we just give you the thanks that you have knowledge of these and you have intention and purpose for them. So Lord, today we ask that you reveal what your purpose is for us in the season we're in so we can bring you more glory and look more like you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so we're going to go real quickly back to the pit. Genesis chapter 37, verses 23 through 24 says this. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, that ornate designer robe he was wearing, remember that? And they took him and threw him into the cistern. The cistern was empty, there was no water in it, nada, nothing, nothing in the pit. Now Pastor Brian did a great job introducing us to this 17-year-old kid with a dream who probably tormented his brothers daily with his ego, with his dream, with his coat. He was overconfident, overbearing, and he poked into their fleshly, brotherly nature that compelled them to finally throw him into the pit for debt. Anyone have a sibling like that that might tempt you in that way? Oh, yeah, I all of a sudden were awake, right? My brother Jim's probably watching this. He's uh, exactly about 11 months older than me, so we're really close. And there were some days I was looking for a pit. You can't always blame somebody for some of the torment and the response <laughs> that they give you towards that. But it just gets you thinking about the family dynamics and where Joseph ended up. They were going to kill him, but instead they threw him in a pit. And the pit was empty. It had nothing. Not even water to survive. There was nothing in there for survival, nothing in there that would give him hope for the future, nothing in there that would make him think I could get my coat back. It was bleak, it was hopeless. Even a normal life pretty much looked far out of reach in the pit. How many have been in a pit season like that when you got nothing? Now, I'm not talking about, you know, I got fired and so I'm not. Those, that's a different test that's coming up in two weeks, so don't forget that. I'm talking about you're in a situation where you, it does not look good. Life, breath, family, it's all just, it's just disappearing. And it can be hopeless. It can get you desperate. Many of you heard the story about me when I was 29 and I uh, contracted uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome from a virus I caught. Guillain Barre is when your body attacks itself, its own nervous system, leaving you paralyzed. And I was about 80% paralyzed. And it's funny that back then we didn't have phones, we didn't have iPods, we didn't have MP3s or 4s or 5s or any of those things. We had what was called the Walkman. How many remember the Walkman? <laughs> Kids, ask your parents about the Walkman cassette player that had no rewind. So if you wanted to listen to something again, flip it over, fast forward. Come on, the struggle's real. Y'all are lazy. You guys are so easy. And when you're 80% paralyzed, I'm just going to let you know that you just you can't. But I had a couple cassette tapes Holly would bring me uh, into me, and one was Worship and Stephen Curtis Chapman. One was the Bible on tape. And it's funny going through Genesis, getting to the pit when you're 80% paralyzed in bed. And you start thinking, wow, it doesn't look good. Now I know how Joseph feels. And that's why God puts these stories in the Bible. Because many of us, if not all of us, at some time will go through a point where it doesn't look good. Life, everything we knew about life, not just designer clothes, but family and everything, looks like it's fallen apart, it's gone away, poof, it's leaving. And this is where Joseph was. 
And when you're in the pit, you have to learn the principle. Brian brought it out. I just want to reiterate it today so we can move on to the palace. Because if you don't remember what you're supposed to learn in the pit, you will not pass the test in the palace. So here's the principle of the pit. Jesus is all you really need. So trust him. Yeah, but there's no water. Jesus is all you really need. So trust him. We think we need so much more in our lives. Coffee. Here, you get your coffee this morning. Some of you don't come until you have your coffee. I get all that. We Coffee, phones, you name. We think we need so much, but the only thing we really need in life is the giver of life. That's it. Joseph had so much going for him in his life. He was an heir of an amazing family and wealth and, and just promise and a dream. He had a, a biggie-sized dream. God biggie-sized his dream. It was huge to a family would serve under him and his coat to prove it. But God knows some things about you and about me and about Joseph. God knows some things about things and possessions and designer coats that sometimes can be a distraction from our overall purpose. And sometimes they get in the way. And sometimes they need to be removed. Sometimes our things become our purpose instead of God's purpose for our lives. So here's what God knows about you. You ready for this? You'll never know that Jesus is the only thing you need until he's the only thing you have. So, to accomplish the dreams that God has for Joseph and the dream that God has for you only requires Jesus. And when Jesus is all you got, he'll be all you focus on. And you'll learn that in the pit. He'll be all you trust. And that's Joseph in the pit. So we're going to take this principle that Jesus is all you really need so you trust him. And then let's move forward as Joseph gets out of the pit and moves into something way better than the pit. We're cheering Joseph on. Yeah, get out of that pit. Joseph, we're going to go to Genesis chapter 39. And as you go there or scroll there, let me just tell you, Genesis chapter 38 is this blip. It's this kind of this strange PG-13, NC-17 kind of chapter. You know, the Bible's got some of those, right, parents? Okay, read those in the children's version to your kids. But it's just got this weird story about Judah and some improprieties. And like, why is this while Joseph's in the pit and his brother Judah's doing these strange things? And I just want to just give you the pastorly tip on that. It's proof that God's grace and mercy supersede our failures when it comes to his plans. Because Judah messed up royally. But his great 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 grandson was David, whose great 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 grandson was Jesus. Don't forget that. So read Genesis 38 and remember it's God's grace and God's mercy. He can still use you. Now let's go to Genesis 39. That was a freebie, by the way. Genesis 39, we're going to go to the palace. It says in verse 1 Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt. Potiphar, an Egyptian who was one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him there. Do I have my um, Israel crowd in here that really watching Israel? Want to come on? Show me your hand, Carolyn. You're, you're one. Of, yeah. You can't pass by this without remembering who's Ishmael. Oh, wait a minute. Joseph's great grandfather Abraham had a dream or had a promise from God that he'd have a son, but it wasn't happening, so he took matters in his own hands, and he got a maidservant pregnant, and that was Ishmael from Hagar, and Ishmael was cast aside, and from then on, it said Ishmael and Abraham's family would clash and conflict and, and be at strife and many times try to kill Abraham's lineage through Jacob. And so... I just want you to know, 4,000 years later, this is still happening. The very Ishmaelites are the ones who are the supposed Palestinians who are fighting Israel. To this day. To this day. 
And why is that important? If you're Joseph and you're praying for God to get you out of the prison, you know the one caveat, your, your prayer, because we all have caveats, Gore, God do this, but don't let it be for this way. You ever pray one of those prayers? God, I would just hope you do this, but don't let it be the, God, just get me out of this pit. Maybe somebody could come along, but don't let it be the Ishmaelites. That's a wink in there from God, by the way. You want it to happen your way, but your enemies are going to pull you out of the pit at times. Are you going to accept the favor from God, even if it's thrown through your enemies? Okay, there's just so much in the Bible. I don't know why we just don't keep reading the Bible more and more. It's amazing. So anyway, Potiphar, second in command, probably not his name, probably the position or the title. He's over all the army and the guardsmen of Pharaoh, who is from Egypt, the king of Egypt, the most powerful nation at the time. Around this time, they're building the pyramids, and they were using slaves from around the world to build the pyramids. And guess who Joseph is? Part of the slave trade going on to build these massive pyramids. There's thousands under Potiphar. Now look what happens in verse 2. The Lord is with Joseph though, so that he prospered. And he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. When his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord gave him success in everything he did, Joseph found favor in his eyes and became his attendant. Now Potiphar put him in charge of his household, and he entrusted to his care everything he owned. From the time he put him in charge of his household and of all that he owned, the Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian because of Joseph. The blessing of the Lord was on everything Potiphar had, both in the house and in the field. So Potiphar left everything he had in Joseph's care, and with Joseph in charge, he did not concern himself with anything except the food he ate. Dude became a foodie overnight. That's it. What am I eating today? Now Joseph was well-built and handsome. I don't know why I went to that verse. I just thought I'd pick us guys up a little bit. There's a long story here, but there's some handsome guys in the story too. All right. Quite a bit has changed in Joseph's life from the pit. Amen? I mean, you got to feel good for Joseph. Now he's living the palace life. He's eating out for dinners. He's even having prime rib instead of chicken nuggets. He's got not one but two chariots that work. And finally, he's got palace insurance. I mean, how many of us are in a much different place in life now than we were earlier in our lives? Just three of us. Boy, we could pray for our people. Lord, bless our people. <laughs> bless them. I mean, me and Holly, when we were dating and then first year of marriage, we had a lot of rice and bean dinners. Special nights, I made her chili over rice. And maybe some, some chicken wings, even though I don't like wings. I know, you just turned me off as a pastor. Like, shut me down. If we went out to dinner, we'd order an appetizer. And one time we went out to dinner and ordered the appetizer and realized it was too much, so we walked away. That was one of our first dates. I said, would you mind? I, don't, I just don't have it. And she goes, yeah, yeah, we get out of here. And so we left. I said sorry to the waitress. And we went out. One of our first dates, I looked at her and said, I'm going to marry you. <laughs> she said, oh, really? You think so, huh? But I got my way. Things were tough then for many of us early on. And then God brings us into new seasons when things are looking pretty good. And really, I'm just going to be honest with you, compared to the rest of the world, and I've traveled in a lot of parts of the world, most Americans are pretty much living a palace life. Most of us are not in a pit. And so you can have a bad day, but just remember this one thing. God has blessed us richly compared to the rest of the world. And so I just want you to say it. Let's be real. I'm living in the palace. But with the palace life comes temptations. I want to just uncover a few temptations before we learn how to pass the test of the palace. There's a few temptations that come when you get out of the pit and you start living better, when you start experiencing better things. The first temptation is this. I'm better in the palace than I was in the pit. 
I'm better off in the palace than I was in the pit. Life is good in the palace. Life is bad in the pit. We, make, we play comparisons all the time. But this must be good, right? When you finally get that home, that car, that bank account that has more zeros behind it, you're like, oh, wow, this is going to be so good. We're going to be so better off. We're going to worry less. We're not going to stress about anything. And our spiritual lives are going to be fire. It's going to be amazing, right? Am I lying? The palace isn't better. It's different. But I'll tell you this, the palace is harder on most of those things. Each test gets harder and harder, not easier and easier, because God's doing something deeper and deeper in you. The more stuff and the more responsibility we get, the more we actually worry about it all. We have more to worry about, and the less peace and contentment we get, and the less passion we seem to have for our Savior, because that spiritual passion seems to get squeezed out as we're busy managing and enjoying and growing all our stuff. We had none of that in the pit. All we had was Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for all this. Thank you, Jesus, for all this stuff. In the pit, we pine away for the palace. Think it's going to be so awesome, but ask anybody older in here, and they'll tell you what fond memories we have of those dating years when we didn't have anything. I don't want to go back, but they were so fond. It was just us and Jesus. He was so real, so simple. Life isn't better in the palace. It's different, and it's harder. So you have to pay attention. Second temptation. I did something to earn this. I did something to achieve this. I got so much up here. I got the skills. I got the talents. You get this confidence that somehow you figured all this out. You got the formula. You should start a podcast. You should help others do what you've learned to do and share your great wisdom. And no offense if you have a podcast doing those things. Please, no offense. But this is what we tend to do as human beings. We need to share how far we've come and what we've learned, and we want to give it away. But Psalm 75 says this, For promotion and power come from nowhere on earth. Nowhere on earth does promotion and power or your advancement come. But only from God. He promotes one and demotes another. He's the one that does this. And so if you write a book, if you do a podcast, if you're sharing information, don't start with, here's what I want to share you in all my skills. Start with this. Just let me tell you this. I I got nothing. God did this. And then you go on because there's wisdom that you have to share. But start with God in humility because you did not do this. God does it all. Okay? Next temptation. I'm the owner of and I must control. I'm the owner of this. I must control. Now, now, kids, you need to know your parents are the owner of your things. But, but it's okay if you say, but no, you don't really own it. <laughs> but we tend to think now that we have it, we need, we need to control it. We need to own it better. Like, like all of a sudden, we're on the throne. I must maintain. I must protect. I must grow this. You start thinking something's yours. And then weird things start to happen in your brain that never happened in the pit. Weird things start to happen in your will and your soul, like greed and, and the desire for more and, and, or a newer and a newer model and a 2.0 because the 1.0 doesn't work with a 2.0 or whatever. And I've got to have this. And, and you start getting selfish a little bit. Can I know I'm protecting? And you get competitive. Well, she's got the 1.0 and the 3.0. And the, Holly just got a new phone. She's got a great new phone, and I'm left with the hand-me-downs. I'm like, come on, we got to have more. And how full of garage do we need before we understand we are hoarding and owning and controlling? I hate to break it to you. You are not in control. You are not in control. I know I'm a recovering control freak. Have you seen my keychain? Recovering because now and then I fall off the control wagon. But, 
There are these temptations when you get into the palace, when life moves forward, when you start to accumulate, when you start to receive blessings from God that you need to be aware of because they're going to keep you from the principle that are going to help you pass the test in the palace. And you don't want to be held back from passing this test because I'm telling you, it's one of the most important things you need to learn. After the first principle of understanding Jesus is all you ever really need, this one is the next most important one. Everything else is his and should be used for him. So here's the principle right here. Everything we have belongs to God and everything we have is to be used for God. Everything we have belongs to God and everything we have is to be used for God. God. I cannot tell you how important it is to learn this principle. I don't care how much you have. You might have little. doesn't matter. Everything you have belongs to him. Everything should be used for him. Many, many believers don't learn this until late in the Christian walk. And here's the problem. You get taken, you take off, you start doing life, you start aspiring and achieving and producing and gaining and accumulating, and you get way ahead for you. Things start becoming about you and what you're doing, and it all comes tumbling down eventually because life wasn't meant for you, and those things weren't meant for you, and it gets devastating when you lose it then because you didn't learn the principle early on. And ultimately, you might end up back in the pit if you don't learn this principle. Such a powerful life you can live if you live by this principle. Powerful life you can live. So how do we pass the palace test? If we're all pretty much in agreement, we live in the palace. Most of us are not in the Joseph's pit. How do we pass the test that God has put us in so that we can live powerfully for God? Number one, here's your first thing. Be filled with Jesus. Be filled with Jesus. I know that sounds like Bible trivia, sounds like Bible college, first semester, be filled, but why, why is it we all forget it? We mouth it, we nod, pastor, amen it, and it's like, I don't know of, the, of a better first step than to be filled with Jesus. Look at verse 2. The Lord was with Joseph so that he prospered. Not Joseph used his skills, prospered, and then the Lord became with Joseph. The Lord was with Joseph. Jesus was with Joseph. Let me take it a little deeper. The Hebrew word for with can also be translated as the preposition en, in, I-N, for all your grammarians out there. This statement could be read, read as the Lord was in Joseph. Hmm. The Lord was in Joseph so that he prospered. Later on, King Pharaoh specifically says this about Joseph. He says, can we find such a one as this, a man in whom is the Spirit of God? Same word. Jesus was in Joseph. Jesus filled Joseph. Joseph was filled with Jesus. Where did Joseph get Jesus? In the pit. When he had nothing else. And what did Joseph take out of the pit into the palace? Jesus in him. It's in the pit that we find out that Jesus is near, that he's listening, that he's all we need. But things change in the palace, right? When we get in the palace, it's, it's natural to pray in the pit. But yet it's so easy to forget about God in the palace. It's when we gain things and responsibly get less into Jesus and more into us. And believe me, I've learned the hard way. When you're not filled with Jesus, you're more likely to be filled with yourself. Have you ever been full of yourself? Has your spouse ever told you you're ever full of yourself? Or your parents? We've all been a little full of ourselves, and this is what I found out, because Holly and I have been married 36 years, just two and a half weeks ago. That's right. <laughs> Give it up for her. She put up with me that long. But we've had times of been fully in Jesus and other times in business when we're just about the things and about the strategies and about the formulas. And we'll take on things like, 
well, that wasn't right. That, that was kind of crazy. We start learning, leaning on our own understanding, our own smarts, our gurus, our podcasts that guide us into new seasons, new jobs, whatever. You get in a new marriage. You got a, a new promotion. You get full of yourself instead of Jesus. You start working off your own understanding, your own ad- advice. You know, I'm going to have a little talk with myself, and this is what I'm going to do today. All of a sudden, Jesus vacates, and you get all full of yourself. And here's what I want you to tell about Jesus. You need to know this as a theological truth. Jesus is omniscient. How many know what that means? All knowing. He knows it all. He knows every hair in your head. He knows your heart. He knows your soul. He knows your entire future and what you need to be doing. Jesus knows it all. It's important to understand that. Kids, if you're in here, you need to understand Jesus slays Google and chat GPT together times a million. Or a quadrillion, as Holly said. Go to Jesus. Jesus. Got a decision? Go to Jesus. Not sure about tomorrow? Go to Jesus. Wonder sure if you should do this, marry her? What? Go to Jesus. Go to Jesus. Go to Jesus. Go to Jesus. You know, and we don't help each other. Sometimes we move on to different positions or, or jobs or promotions or whatever, or we take on things, and we, you know what we do? We say, hey, you got this, dude. You can do it, man. You, you, you can do this. You got, you'll figure it out. No, you won't. You don't have this. We'd be better friends say, you don't got this. But you got Jesus, now you got it. Don't just say you got it, because if they don't have Jesus, it's going to fail miserably. It's going to end up back in the pit. Be a really good friend and say, I don't think you have this. Jessica, you don't have this. That thing you're looking for, hoping for, aspiring to, you got, you don't have that. I don't want to set you up for failure. Or you got Jesus? Let's figure out how to make sure you have Jesus, because he's got it all. He's got your whole future in his hands, because he knows it all. Make sure you have Jesus. Make sure you have Jesus. If you're not filled with Jesus in the palace, Jesus will not hesitate to send you back to the pit to get him. You think that's a mean God? Because he wants to be in you, closer to you, more intimate with you, that he would take you out of the palace, send you back to the pit, so make sure that happens? No, it's a loving God. Make sure you have Jesus. Number two, be open about your faith. Be open about your faith. I know it's hard in today's culture, cancer culture, to be vocal about who you are, why you do things. But imagine being a 17-year-old teenage immigrant among people who worship the sun god, who are very intolerant to others and how he stood up. Look at verse 2 again. It says, his master saw that the Lord was with him. And the Lord gave him success in everything he did. Non-believers don't look at your success or your skill and immediately attribute to God. They just think, man, that guy's a whiz. That, she's really smart. That kid's really a go-getter. She can knock it out of the park. They just think it's you, your skill. Potiphar didn't recognize that God was with Joseph because of his skill. It's because Joseph was vocal about who and why he did what he did. Joseph became vocal about, this is how I can do these things so well. This is how I can prosper, because it's the God in me. How do I know that? Because he lived the rest of his life, the next 13 chapters, that very same way. Joseph didn't take the credit. Didn't, Joseph didn't hear Potiphar say, you are so good. And he goes, Shucks, you're so right. I'm so good. I don't know. That's just me. No, he didn't. He says, oh, it's God with me. It's the Lord is with me. The Lord is with me. The Lord is with me. We um, opened a Swiller Bees down in Ormond Beach. Some of you have been there, so thank you so much for supporting. Swiller Bees Donuts, if you don't know what that is. Best donuts on the planet. Um, <laughs> there's an older gentleman who goes to our Flagler Beach who watched us open the next two stores, and he said to me last week, as he was getting his coffee, he said, I visit your store, but you need to know I've been watching you guys over the last few years. And I'm just enamored by how well you guys are doing. Good job. Good job. 
Mm, that's such a good job. And I thought about this because I was preaching this week, and I thought, hmm, I got a choice here to say, thank you, we're pretty smart in business, we're good at it, we're really good. But here's something that Holly taught me a long time ago. Have that God response ready. She'll go into a Walmart, and an attendant just probably isn't having a great day, and she'll say, how are you? And God, Holly will always say, God has blessed me so much, thanks for asking. Tribute to God. And I just said, you know what? We don't really have much, a little bit of knowledge, but God's done it all. He's really directed us and blessed us so much. And the guy just went, I guess you're right, and walked off. Oh, just a quick God, God mention to see what doors might open. Where do you vocally bring attention to God's goodness when your skills, when your presence is noticed? If I asked those you work with, Kids, if I ask those you go to school with, your teachers, if I were to ask those people around you, would they identify that the Lord is with you? Would they ever know? Do they have a clue when they talk to you? When you're full of Jesus, you'll have to tell somebody about him. Because he's doing so much in you and through you, you'll have to attribute to him. So, be open about your faith. Number three, be a manager and not an owner. Be a manager and not an owner. We want to be, in, we're Americans, we want to own it, own it big, own it all. Hopefully own it debt free, but that doesn't seem to be working well for most Americans. I'm amazed at how easy it is for me to take ownership of things, and it just gets me in trouble all the time. Look at verse four, Potiphar put Joseph in charge of his household, and he entrusted to his care everything he owned. What did Joseph own? Nothing. Potiphar owned it all. And this is the thrust of our principle here. Listen, I want you to raise your hands. I want you to raise your hands. How many in here own, own a home? Even if the bank has a note. Keep your hands up. How many own a car? Keep your hands up, all of you. Don't put them down. How many own two cars? If you still owned a car, keep your hands up. Never put those down. This is also fitness routine. You own a home, you own a car, you own two cars. How many own an e-bike? Any e-bikers out there? Okay. Uh, how many own land somewhere? Everyone's hand should still be up. They put it up before. I want to see all the hands. Okay. Kids, how many own a PlayStation or a digital game like that? Uh, how many own your own phone, iPhone or the dreaded droid? Okay, how many of your kids own a car? Okay, keep your hands up. You own nothing. <laughs> you own nothing. I don't care if you thought you paid for it. You didn't even own the money that you paid for that thing. <laughs> and the money you're paying off that loan ain't your money either. Turn to your neighbor and say, you own nothing. Kids, turn to your... You own nothing. Hey, kids, turn to your parents and say, neither do you. We are managers. We are stewards of everything. Many places in the Bible teach us who owns it all. Here's the best one I found. Colossians 1.16 says this. For by Jesus were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible. Does that incorporate all things? Yeah. All things were created by him, whether they be thrones, dominions, principalities, powers, people in authority, presidents, governors, all things were created by him and who? And for him. For, say it again. For him. All things seen and unseen are for him. Jesus owns it all. And everything we have, he gives us not to own, but to manage, to steward for him, for his glory, for his purpose. And God's given every one of us gifts and talents to manage those things all throughout life for him. Joseph had a gift of administration and multiplication, and he used it well. But 
you know, now when you read back in chapter, and when he was 17, you thought he was being a lazy teenager, hanging back at home while his brothers went out to take care of the sheep. But it really was that his parents understood that he's got wiring and gifts, and they could be better utilized back home, administering those things to make sure the family wealth and everything was going well. And now Joseph's just revisiting that before he got in trouble, and now he's prospering for Jesus. Parents, one of the best things you can teach your kids and parent your kids on is understanding and identifying how they're gifted, what their talents are, and how it can be utilized for Jesus for the rest of their lives. You don't need to wait till they're 20 or 30 or even 40 to figure that out. I can tell you right now, I know my granddaughter Amelia, she could plan our vacation this coming week to the lake house all the way down to how many miles it's going to take, how much gas it's going to take. She's six years old. She's got a gift of administration and planning and strategizing. My grandson Gabriel, three and a half years old, he's an engineer. He wants to know how everything works, where all the pipes go, all the wires go. He's just pulling apart my pool stuff, trying to figure out where the water's going. He wants to see out where it comes out. That little boy's an engineer. He's going to build incredible masterpieces for God. I already at three, he understands that. You don't have to wait, but God's done that for you too. He's wired you in certain ways for his glory. You don't own anything except for the gifts he's given you to manage and steward the things, the blessings he's given you for his glory. Amen? Number four, last one. Be a kingdom builder and not an accumulator. We are not born to accumulate. I don't care what you think, how big your garage is and how much you can put in there. God did not create us to accumulate. He, he, he created us to build a kingdom for him. We get in a cush life, it becomes a race to what's next and how big, what more, because enough's never enough, there's got to be one more, but he doesn't want you to accumulate. He wants you not to accumulate with it, but build with it. Jesus wants you to use all that he's given you to help him change the world, to bring more people to Jesus. Jesus is always about saving the lost and building his kingdom, especially when he blesses you in the palace. We see this concept in 2 Corinthians 9. 2 Corinthians 9, Paul says this, God will generously provide all you need. How many know that? He will generously provide all you need. But did you know this? You will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. Oh, wait a minute, I like the leftovers to share with others. You will be made rich in every way so that you can be generous on one occasion a year. When you feel like it, when you like the person. No, 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 you will be made rich in every way so you can be generous on every occasion. Every occasion. What do I have that's extra? What does God want to use? How can I bring more glory to God? How many more can come to Jesus if I show the goodness of God to them? Jesus is blessing you with talents and treasure, not so you can hoard it, but you can build with it. So you can give it away and model the goodness and the kindness and the love of Jesus Christ to others so they have to turn to him. And then he says this, as a result of your ministry, they, the very ones you've been generous to, will give glory to God. That's the formula. Going to bless you richly and give you extra so you bless others to mimic God's glory, God's goodness so that they then give glory to God. It's pretty simple. We make it way more complex. Jesus is blessing you for this very thing. And everything we have is to be used for him. And this is what Joseph did. His master saw that the Lord was with him, and he put him in charge of everything. And then the Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian because of Joseph. He identified God because of the blessings. Hmm. Jesus worked hard for Joseph worked hard for Jesus. Jesus blessed Joseph. Joseph was, was vocal about his faith. Potiphar got blessed because of Joseph, and then he became aware of of who God was. We don't know the rest of the story, and that's not up to us. Anything we've been given is useful and can bless others. Anything from from our talents to our treasures, we got nothing outside of Jesus. 
but he's given us these talents and treasures to be useful to him so we can do all things unto him. Colossians 3 says this, work willingly at whatever you do as though you were working for the Lord rather than for people and yourself. Remember that the Lord will give you an inheritance as your reward and the master you are serving in Christ. If you live in the palace like Joseph lived in the palace, if you consider all things that he's given you to be his and to be used for his glory, there's an internal inheritance promised for you. Can Pastor Mike tell you what that is? Nope. It's not my inheritance to give. But there's an inheritance. And the return of investment is astronomical. I call it the E-R-O-I, the E-R-O-I, eternal return on investment. And it's not a piddly 5% you get from the stock market, or maybe you got a little more going on there in a different fund. It's eternal. It's exponential. It's the well done, good and faithful servant when you were in the palace. Come into my glory. Would it be okay if God were to bless you this week so that you could turn around and bless others and see more people come to Jesus? Would it be okay if you went home today, maybe you don't want to go in your garage, but go around and then enter your garage and say, look at all the leftover that we have. How can we use this for God's glory? How can we bless others in need so that they might give glory to God? Would it be okay if we reassessed our life and say, look at God's given us. We're not in the pit. We're in the palace. How many more can we bring into God's palace? What if our families came together? What if you brought your kids together and say, we've got a different life plan right now. It's not accumulation of wealth. It's not trying to grow our kingdom. It's building his kingdom. Kids, what do you got? Well, no, wait a minute. We own nothing. What can we give? What can we use? How can we share? How can we be vocal about our faith? Because everything we have belongs to God even the breath we breathe. Everything we have is to be used for God to build his kingdom. And if you miss that, your life will be about you and you'll be calling me from the pit. I don't want that for you. I want to see you be used mightily for building God's kingdom. I want God to bless you richly and find you faithful in that. Because you're trying to outgive God to bless others, to bring more souls into his palace. Amen? But you got to make that assessment. Where are you at? Are you full of Jesus? Are you vocal about your faith and what he's done for you to get you out of the pit? Are you managing well? Are you building something besides your kingdom? Don't go another day without assessing. Because you will come to a point where you're going to see Jesus face to face. And I don't know, it's not in Revelation, but I got, a, I got an inkling that he's going to show you all he's given you. You say, what'd you do? Did you build your kingdom or mine? Did you resist temptations and pass the test? Well done. Look at your inheritance. I have a suspicion the inheritance will be thousands and thousands of people that you touched. And they're going to come give you a high five and a hug and say thank you for sacrificing. Thank you for giving. Thank you for sharing the Lord. Thank you for being vocal. Thank you, thank you, thank you for building the kingdom because I'm in here because of you. What an inheritance that would be.